So let's try to do um, return to, to seeing, OK, we solved the equation. We, we seem to be OK. What did we really approximate? We didn't approximate saying h bar goes to 0. We did a more serious physical approximation. And let's try to see what, what we really did. So I think the whole clue is in, uh, in this top equation there. You have the first term and the second term. And our claim is that the second term is smaller than the first term, with h bar there. So for example, uh, now, of course, in the solution, uh, the first term is identically 0, and the second term, the coefficient of h bar, is identically 0. But uh, we can look at one of those, for example, um, and, and say that, so the validity of the approximation, dt of the approximation. It's, it's pretty useful to do this. So we say, um, for example, there, that term, h bar, s0 double prime, that enters into the order h bar part of the equation, the absolute value of it must be much smaller than a typical term, s0 prime, for example, s0 prime squared in the first term. So each term, so basically I'm saying each term in the first bracket must be much larger than each term in the second bracket. And you could have picked any ones because they're all equal after all. So let's see if that is the case. So recall that S0 prime from there is really p of x plus minus p of x. So what do we have here? h bar and S0 double prime is dp dx. Must be much smaller than p of x squared. Now, it's a matter of playing with these things a little bit until you find some way that the inequality tells you a story. And the way I'll do it is by saying that this is h bar 1 over p squared of x dp dx is much smaller than 1. And here, I'll write this as h bar d, uh, no h bar, d dx of h bar over p. Look what I did. d dx of 1 over p is 1 over p squared dp dx, and the h bar I put it in. Here we go. What does this say? This is the local de Broglie wavelength. This is saying that ddx of the local de Broglie wavelength must be much smaller than 1. A nice result. Your local de Broglie wavelength must have a small derivative. So this is the physics translation of the semi-classical approximation. H bar going to zero is a mathematical device. But this is physical. This is telling you what should happen. Uh, most of us look at that and say, an easier way to understand that equation, d lambda dx, it has the right units. Lambda has units of length. x has units of length. So that derivative must have no units. And if it's supposed to be small, it should be small compared to 1. So this is a conventional inequality. Most of us would 
prefer maybe to write it like this. Lambda, d lambda dx, is much smaller than lambda. And I think this is a little clearer because this is how much the de Broglie wavelength changes over a distance equal to the de Broglie wavelength. So you have a de Broglie wavelength and the next de Broglie wavelength. How much did it change? That must be small compared to the de Broglie wavelength. So the change of the de Broglie wavelength after you move one de Broglie wavelength must be smaller than the de Broglie wavelength. Uh, I don't know if you like it. Uh, otherwise, you can take this one. I'll do another one, another version of the inequalities, and you can play with those inequalities. It's kind of uh, takes a while until you convince yourself that you're not uh, missing anything. Think of p squared equal to m e minus v of x. Take a derivative, d dx. So I'll have p, p prime. This is 2 p, p prime, but with this 2, uh, I'm going to cancel it. As, at some point, of course, we, we're taking all kinds of factors of 2 and ignoring them. Remember that true the Broglie wavelength is h over p, not h bar over p. So. Um, Factors, by the time you go to these inequalities, two pi's uh, are gone. M, we're differentiating with respect to x and taking absolute value, so we'll write it like this. Or dv dx, dx equals 1 over m p p prime. That is so far exact. Let me multiply by a lambda, so I'll have a lambda. And the lambda dv dx um, is equal to um, yeah, lambda, okay, lambda is h bar over p, so I can cancel one of these p's and get h bar over m p prime. Okay, h bar over m p prime. Now look at uh, this equation, I'm sorry, we play with, this is a little like trial and error, you're trying to, move around your inequality. So here we have something, h bar dp dx is much less than that. So this term is because of this inequality is much smaller than p squared over m. And now we have something nice. Um, I'll write it here. Lambda of x dv dx is much smaller than p squared over 2m. That's another nice one. Uh, I think this one is. The and this says that the potential must be slowly varying for this to be true because. The change in the potential over at the Broglie wavelength, dv dx times lambda of x is an estimate for the change of the potential over the de Broglie wavelength, is much smaller than the kinetic energy of the particle. So that's again another thing that makes sense. Uh, it's kind of nice. So. Uh, this is the way, at the end of the day, this h bar going to zero approximation has become a physical statement. It is a statement of um, quantities varying slowly. Because after all, that's what motivated the expansion from the beginning. 
So let's see if we ever get in trouble with this. So we're trying to solve physical problems of particles in potentials. And uh, most of the times, we're interested in bound states or energy eigenstates. At least uh, simple energy eigenstates are bound states. So here is a, a situation. We have a, a sketch of a situation. We have a v of x. This is x. This is a v of x. And some energy e. And uh, let's assume we're looking close enough to the point x equal a so that the v of x, however it curves, at that point is roughly straight. That's a reasonable thing to do. So we'll model v of x minus e, v of x minus e, as being linear near x equals a. So it's g times x minus a, where g is some positive constant, which is the slope at this point. So look at x less than um, a. At this point, you are in the allowed region. You're in the region to the left of the point A, where your energy is bigger than the potential, and that's perfectly allowed. So, um, so here, E minus V of x, which is the negative of that, would be G A minus x. And p is square root of 2m e minus v of x, so uh, g a minus x. That's p of x. So that's your position-dependent momentum. Uh, it's going to go to 0 at that point. And lambda, which is h bar over p, is h bar over square root of 2mg, 1 over square root of a minus x. So take the derivative, d lambda dx. Take the absolute value of it. That's. Um, h bar over square root of 2mg times 1 half 1 over a minus x to the 3 halves. We're differentiating with respect to x. And now you see uh, the trouble. If you had not uh, seen it before, uh, the validity of the semi-classical approximation is taken and requires the lambda dx to be much smaller than 1. And as you approach x equals to a, this grows within, without bound. It just becomes bigger and bigger. You can choose g to be large, and you can choose m to be large, but still, you get closer and closer, you eventually fail. This thing goes to infinity as x goes to a and grows without limit, and the semi-classical approximation crashes. You know, I would imagine that many people got this far with the semi-classical approximation of writing this and doing that, but this is a tremendous obstacle. Um, why is it an obstacle? Why can't we just forget about that region? Because most of the times you're do, dealing with bound states. So you will have a very slowly varying potential here. 
But if you want to find bound states, you need the fact that there's a forbidden region where the wave function destroys itself. So whatever you can solve where the wave function is slowly varying here is not enough because you need to know how it decays. And therefore, you need to face this corners where the semi classical approximation fails. Our problem here is that we know how to write a solution here. We probably know how to write a solution here. Those are these ones, but we have no idea how to write them here, so we cannot connect the two solutions. It's a serious difficulty. It's so people work hard on that, and I think that is the breakthrough of the uh, construction of this WKB people. What they did is they solved the equation exactly in this region, assuming a linear potential. They solved it exactly, and then those functions, the airy functions, show up. And you know how the area functions behave. So they solve it here. They related it to the solution to the right, related it to the solution on the left. And in that way, even though we don't have to write the solution in this region, we know how a solution on the middle connects to a solution on the right. This is the subject of the connection formulas in WKB. We will discuss that next time. We will go through some of that analysis because it's interesting and fairly non-trivial. But I will mention one of the connection formulas and use it. That's the rest of what we're going to do today.